Welcome to the Black Girls Hail podcast, where we talk about changing unavailable relationship patterns, healing unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first you and then others. Every episode, we will talk about actionable advice that you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow your self-worth. I'm Sheena Tubbs. Let's begin. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. We are going to jump right in with today's episode today because we are talking about four mistakes that one can make as a love addict in committed relationships and or marriage. The title says marriage because of length, (laughs) but also just because this is typically where people are like, how does this fit for me? So many of the teachings that I have here on this podcast are targeting situations for single women. And I absolutely have women of all ages and of all relationship statuses listening to this because you relate to it. And so I really thought it'd be important to have some episodes that talk about how do intimacy disorders show up in committed partnerships when you are not dating, but y'all are, have been together. So If you're just now joining this series, something for you to know is that I am sharing different mistakes that I have made personally in my journey, which means that the list that I'm going to give is not going to be exhaustive of all of the ways that this can show up, but I'm sharing out of my personal experience and strength and understanding and hopes of giving words to anybody who can relate. If it is not your experience, that is totally fine. This is not the episode for you. If it is your experience, I hope that you find some resilience in it. And I hope that you find some community that you're not alone. And also that there are clear ways out. And if this was you, but it ain't no more, I totally celebrate you and I rejoice with you. And I am so amazed by you for doing the hard work to heal and to be open and to be able to be a healthy and available partner to your loved one. So that's great. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in. So I'm going to be talking about love addiction and partnerships. So the mistakes that I made as a love addict in my different partnerships. So for those of you who do not know, love addiction is the persistent obsession of a person, a relationship, or the fantasy of who you want that person or relationship to be and mistaking it as love. We use this as a way to self-medicate. That if this person is exactly how I want them to be, if they say what I want them to say, if they think how I want them to think, if this relationship gets resolved in this certain way, if they always treat me this certain way, that I am going to feel full on the inside. That is just this relationship that is the missing piece. A lot of times people think that their the rest of their life is perfect, but it's just the relationship part when really... The relationship is really just a mirror of some of the things that you have going on inside of you that you might not have words for and you just might be overcompensating in all these other areas of your life, but you have some some wounds that need to be healed that you're hoping that this person or the partnership will fix for you. So for me, one of the mistakes that I made when I was trying to get my dating relationships or partnerships to fix me is I would project my insecurities onto them. So this can look in a couple of ways. The first one was this need for a constant verbal affirmation that I was enough. And sometimes I would ask for it. Sometimes I would hint for it. Sometimes they would say things that I would interpret to be slights on me or insults of my worth or how I'm showing up in the relationship when it literally had nothing to do with that, but I was projecting my insecurity. So for example, if we went to a dinner party of friends and the person who hosted actually cooked the meal and he would say something like, wow, that was a really great meal. That was amazing. I would interpret that to mean that he was saying that I wasn't a good cook and that the things that I cooked before, he's just really unsatisfied with and that she's better and he would want to be with someone like her anyways. And I would just go down this really dark rabbit hole when literally he was just complimenting an experience that happened that had nothing to do with this woman being better than me or me not being good enough or him not being satisfied with me as a partner. But those were all the things that I felt on the inside. And so I could take anything 
and I could make up a story around it because that was the story I already had within myself. And so that is a very unfair place to be in a relationship because it doesn't matter what the person says and what they try to do to rectify it because they're not the problem. It's how I feel and how I think about myself. So it's never going to be enough. The other way that my insecurities may have shown up in my previous partnerships when I was very active in my love addiction was I had a deep, intense fear of being left (laughs) and abandoned, right? Going back to the insecurity of not feeling enough, I had this deep, intense dread that they might change their mind or this is not going to last that long or I always had to do whatever I needed to do to make sure that I stayed desirable to them. So whether or not it was related to my body shape to what we were doing together sexually, to whether or not I was smart enough or making him laugh or whatever it might be, I had to always be the perfect partner. And if not, they would leave. And that put a lot of intensity on the relationship. It put a lot of intensity because whether or not I said it, like people can tell when you are trying a little bit too hard. And the person may want to respond and hold space for you. But again, there's not really anything that they can do to make you feel safe enough to relax, to make you feel safe enough to trust that, Sheena, I'm not going anywhere and I like you. I like you. But what will happen is because of, or what would have happened, what used to happen. (laughs) Sorry, I'm trying to put all the timelines together in the right tense. What would happen is because I had so much insecurity about whether or not he really likes me or whether or not he could change his mind or whether or not I would do something to mess it up is that I would mess it up. It would be really hard just to relax and to be together and for it to be easy. Even if it started off really easy, usually it would start off really easy because I was pretending and I was so focused on being what they would want me to be. And then when it came time to show up as myself and to have my own opinion, I just didn't know how to do that. So that is the first one. And it's actually related to the second one. The second mistake that I would make in my partnerships and my committed long-term partnerships with people is I would drop everything to become super available to who they wanted me to be and how they wanted me to be. And I... Actually, I think I just need to combine this with the next one because it's going to be hard to explain it without overlapping. The next one is I would also brag about or at least feel pride about being considered a good or quote unquote easy girlfriend because I was so needless. So I remember I had one partner who told me, you know, you, you're just really easy. I hear about the things that my, my friends talk about with their girlfriends and just being with you that... I don't really have any of that drama. And I remember feeling, oh, wow, like that's awesome. Like I'm such such a good girlfriend and I'm just easy to be with and easy to get along with. And I was like, that's great. But here's what made it easy. <laughs> I was easy because I kept my mouth shut. I was easy because I would smile and go along with whatever he wanted. I was easy because I was available when he wanted me to be available. I was easy because, you know, I would have endless patience for all the time he wanted to spend with other people or do other things that I may not have been invited to. And I didn't cause any ruckus. And that is not a healthy place to be. It's not a healthy place to be at all. It's not healthy to be a shell. So a healthy relationship involves two people showing up as their full selves. And so let me speak to my to my ladies who may be in long-term committed partnerships, but it looks like, you know, maybe marriage or stay-at-home wife. And this is a role that you actually want. For some people, they may be resentful of that. But for you, you take great pride and pleasure in being the matriarch and the caretaker of your home. That is awesome. But here's the thing. Even with how amazing you run your household and mother your children, you are still a woman with your own interests and desires and opinions and personality. And you get to be a full woman who has all of those things and who is also a mother and a wife as well. If you drop your full identity to be fully dependent on someone else outside of you to give you notes on who you should be and how you feel, that's a lot of power. 
And again, this is not for everybody, y'all. This is not for everyone who has a role in the house where you are a stay-at-home mom. This is only for the women who are listening more intently as I talk right here, where you are wondering if you're missing something, that you're wondering if there is a reason why you may feel so discontent and unsatisfied because when you're operating in love addiction and very dependent on someone else to value you, if they are caught up with work, are caught up in another relationship outside of the home, are caught up with volunteering, are caught up with the kids, are caught up with something outside of you, you feel empty and you feel alone and you feel purposeless and you feel like you are lacking and that you were making a mistake. When none of those things are true, what the only reason that feels true is because you haven't known how to esteem yourself and value yourself and see yourself outside of the relationship that you may have with your partner, your kids, or other people. And so when they're not affirming you or paying attention or praising you and appreciating you, your value dips or your felt sense of value dips. Your, your, your value is consistent. It's always 100%. You're worth rubies and jewels and diamonds and you're just you're priceless but you don't feel that way right and so for me it was so easy for me to be a easy girlfriend or easy girlfriends at the time because i was amazing at people pleasing i was amazing at adjusting and becoming the person that people needed me to be to make their lives easier to make them happy to make me be well liked in their eyes. And so I use that power in in partnerships. And eventually what happened with that is people don't respect that y'all. I'm just gonna say it plainly. People don't respect people who don't have their own identities and personalities. And the reason why is there is nothing to attach to. So instead of y'all being opposite sides of Velcro, you know, they're the scratchy side and you're the soft side, you're both the scratchy side or you're both the soft side. Like there's no attachment because you're just mirroring whoever they are, right? So there's nothing to connect to. The way that you actually have real connection with people is that friction, is that full development of disagreements, is that full development of, you know, what it looks like in my household is Avengers versus DC or who is the best Avenger, you know, and us having very intense disagreements about that, <laughs> you know, there is magic in the mess when you are with a healthy person that actually values who you are. And so if you're in a relationship with someone who is narcissistic or you're in relationship with someone who's unavailable. And so I'll have another episode about this later on, but not everyone who is unavailable is a bad person. I mean, actually half, I think almost everyone listening to this <laughs> actually may be unavailable in some aspects. So we, we know we are not bad people. We know that we have the capacity to shut down and not attach to folks, right? But sometimes out of convenience, someone who is unavailable because they have their own stuff that they don't really they don't really want to or know how to show up or be open in that way, they'll take someone who's just going along to get along. And and I need you to know that you're the one who's in charge of expressing and finding your personality. Nobody else, right? If there's anything that you want to do, if there's anything that you want to say, that you want to study, that you want to be... You only got one life, sis. You only got one life and now's the time. Now is the time for you to do it. So build yourself, build your personality. I do not care how old you are. I don't care what you've done before. I don't care how long you've been in this relationship. Those are all excuses. They're all excuses. And there might be pain points that you need to actually heal. It may not be as easy as just go and do it. Actually, I know it's not as easy because that's literally what I teach, that this is not about willpower and trying to shame yourself and criticize yourself to making a change. You need to heal whatever it is that's making it hard for you to step out and, and be fully who you are, to step past that fear, to step past that fear of, what will happen if I actually become who I am and they don't like it? And why that is a determining factor that you would, you would stay stuck there. What is actually most important to you? And you get to choose. 
You get to choose exactly how you want to show up. I just need you to know and have access to that choice within yourself. And so with that, let's go ahead and talk about the third mistake that I have made in committed partnerships as a love addict. As a love addict, I have previously been overcommitted to fixing it, quote unquote, when there were very obvious red flags. Um, Red flags that show that there was a problem, that there was something wrong, that there needed to be a break. And so this is where it gets tricky because part, there's two things happening here. There's two truths that are simultaneously existing. The first truth is that relationships are work. You are hopefully in relationship with another human being. And so when anytime you're in a relationship with another human, there are going to be disagreements. There's going to be the conflict of your trauma against their trauma. There's going to be the conflict of you grew up a certain way, you have certain traditions, and they have different ones or don't have any at all, and they may fight against wanting to pick up your traditions. There could be language and cultural differences, especially my ladies who are in interracial relationships, and interracial does not just mean black and non-black. It can also be between, you know, Haitian immigrants, uh, Haitian American folks who marries a Nigerian American person and just the, the cultures, the similarities, while also the cultures that go with that. There's so many layers to that, right? And in being in relationship with another person, you're going to have to go through these rough patches and learn how to accommodate and, and compromise and learn that you can share and sometimes you don't always have to be right and how to attend to the other person. So that's the first truth. That's a big truth, but it's the first truth. The second truth is that there are some rough patches and there are some things that happen that are not typical and normal and healthy things that people can can or should work through. There are some things that are red flags and when we are in a addictive state and we're not fully connected to ourselves in a healthy way, which means that we are aware of what our, our boundaries are, that we know what our standards are, that we know what we deserve to be treated as, and also what we have access and capability to give to the other person without draining ourselves. If we are not in line with that or aligned with that is the right word if we're not aligned with that and in tune with that what we will do is we start we will start to overcompensate and forgive and justify red flags as they occur in the relationship and we will rationalize it because we are committed because we've made this vow because we've made this promise even if we are not married we made this promise to stick things out with with this person And we have in our mind that that means that we have to stay, that we have to take everything that comes and and you don't. And so this is always tricky to talk about, you know, that this is where I would really recommend for you to listen to podcasts or to talk to your couples therapist to fully navigate what is red line behavior versus typical normal couple stuff and even the things that are red line behaviors, are they things that can be healed and fixed? I strongly, strongly, strongly you suggest I strongly suggest you talk to someone who's an expert who is actively working in those areas right now. And I double strongly suggest for it to be someone who has specific training in couples dynamics and mental health and not just someone who is a casual learner because of how layered these issues can be. But going back to my experience as a love addict in committed partnerships, you know, I mentioned this when I talked about my dating relationships, but from the beginning, I would consider in the first episode where I talked about dating as a love addict, I would, I had already committed to these people in my mind from the onset, from the beginning, I was committed to making it work. These were people that were going to be my husband. I had many, I've had many husbands, (laughs) I've had many husbands in my heart and my mind leading up to my my current husband. But I was so quick to take whatever was happening or not happening in the relationship and look for so many solutions to make it better. So I would 
put my own self in my little performance improvement plan. I would go and look for ways to become a better communicator and express how I felt and talk about things. I would try to get us to go to counseling. I would try to give them space. I would do everything I could to try to fix it when really the things that were happening were not my responsibility to fix. They had nothing to do with me, but more and and what the partners I had at that time were able and willing to give. So sometimes they just weren't able to give me what I needed, but I was going to try to diminish what I needed to, to stay with them. And sometimes the people were not willing to give me what I needed, and I was going to try to stay and diminish what I needed <laughs> to stay with them. And, and tell myself I was selfish or needy or whatever I needed to do in the meantime. Instead of understanding that this was a choice, that I had a choice to stay here and I could also choose me. Part of it is I had so much fear that was left over from unresolved poverty trauma. And again, I also hope to have a series on money trauma eventually soon. Poverty trauma totally in this in this fear of lack, of not having enough, of who knows when the next one is going to come along. All of this definitely um, impacted my personal relationships as well, that poverty mindset when it came to relationships. And so I had this belief that this was it and this was the one and I had to make it work because who knew, who knows if I was going to find someone better when there are billions of people in the world, right? And but the thought was there may be billions, but they're not all going to want me, right? Now, I know somebody felt that one. There may be billions, but not everyone's going to want me, that there's something wrong with me, right? And so that's, that's where I keep coming to our worth. It is all about our worth because what happens when you are securely attached and when you know your worth, when you get into these relationships, you can know, all right, I love this person. And sometimes it's love and sometimes it's that you're trauma bonded and you're confusing the fact that they remind you of past trauma part people with love. But again, that's a conversation for a different day. But you can say, all right, I love this person and I want to be here, but being here hurts and I deserve better. But that deserving better that you fully are connected to that. So many people will say things like that. They'll say, I'm leaving because I deserve better. But you're saying it in the emotional moment. You're saying it because they just hurt you, betrayed you, or pissed you off. And you're like, I deserve better than this. And you leave. And part of it, sometimes, especially if you're active in your love addiction, is is a hope that they're going to come and run after you and try to fix it and apologize. And if that doesn't happen, once your anger or your righteousness, your self-righteousness or your sadness or embarrassment about happen starts to dissipate, so does your strength. And you will be more open to going back. And so the key to this is actually to be aligned with your value for you to fully own and know. And just like you know that the sky is blue, to know that you are amazing and valued and for you to not only feel that self-righteous indignation and ownership of yourself, when someone has pissed you off before it to be a constant. And if we don't have access to that, we will take the little rinky dink apologies and crumbs and, you know, access to having their body, right? So many of us really are so lonely or we are so physically deprived of affection that the fear of not having access to that warmth and that comfort, even when that warmth and comfort is not consistent, and even when it comes with countless days and hours of pain, we'll take it because we're so afraid to be without it. And we just have to move to a place where we are, we can own that those are desires of our hearts and that we deserve to have those things, but not at the sake of ourselves. So in past partnerships, like I said, I'll be very overcommitted to fixing it when it was time for me to be out it was time for me to go and for me to not go as a as a game of chicken to try to see if they were going to try to stop me or as a threat or an ultimatum, but to truly go and be gone and to make room for relationships that could show up in the way that I needed them to. So that's it for this episode. 
if you're someone who's listening and you're like, oh my gosh, I do not know if this is a red flag or not, and you want to reach out to ask me, I strongly encourage you to ask a couples therapist or professional in your area. Because when it comes to marriage and kids and long-term partnerships, there are so many factors that go into that. There's so much history. And especially if it's something that can be salvaged and fixed, you want to have access to someone on the ground to help you work through that. So I am not the best person for you for that. If you're listening to this podcast and you want to do some work on the, your worthiness, then uh, this month we are doing our special on our You Are Worthy course. I'm giving $50 off. So just go to blackgirlshealorg slash worthy, enter the coupon code MAY2021 to get a discount. And what that course does is it talks about the different sources of low self-worth, where they comes from, where it comes from talks about treating yourself with self-compassion and self-kindness, and also gives some great journaling prompts and exercises for you to work through at your own timing, on your own pace, to kind of navigate what it is that I want, what do I actually want in relationships, how do I want to show up for myself. So that's available for you. And that is it for this episode. Next week, I'm coming with my final episode about navigating love avoidance in relationships. I feel like this is this is probably the one that is most commonly talked about with the women that I serve. I don't feel confident enough to say that it is the most common period, but I definitely know that when it comes to women that I support, they may have been doing their own healing work or had an amazing story and experience where in the middle of their doing the work or before they even got started, they were able to be connected with that healthy and available partner, which is awesome, but it's really hard for them to receive and to show up and to be present without pushing the person away. And so that's where the love avoidance comes in at. And so that's what we're going to be talking about next week, y'all. So that is it for today's episode. I'm sending you all so much love and I will see you next time. Take care. Hey, so thanks for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoy what you learned today, it doesn't have to stop here. Check out the Black Girls Heal website at blackgirlsheal.org for more resources to help you heal from intimacy disorders like love addiction and love avoidance. The best time to start or restart your healing journey is now. You can grab a free copy of our five-step roadmap to heal love addiction, love avoidance, and love deprivation by going to blackgirlsheal.org slash roadmap. And if you're on social media, feel free to follow us at Black Girls Heal on Instagram and Facebook.